Good afternoon and welcome back for this afternoon's sessions. I'm Deborah Lair, the Executive Director of the Paulson Institute and the CEO of Edelman Global Advisory. We are absolutely, oh, and also a very proud Meridian House trustee. I can't forget that. Uh, we are delighted as the Paulson Institute to be co-sponsoring today's activities and excited about the panel that we have next as the Paulson Institute. We're focused on U.S.-China relations with a heavy emphasis on conservation, biodiversity, climate change. And given the background of our founder and chairman, Hank Paulson, as a CEO and as somebody who has dedicated his life to conservation, we're very proud to be part of today's panel. Um, as you all know, anybody who reads the papers knows that the U.S.-China bilateral relationship is increasingly fraught. And it has really devolved over the decades. One area, though, that we hope will continue to be a bright spot is climate and the environment. So far, the two sides have tried very hard to compartmentalize this part of the relationship. It's largely broken down uh, at the federal level, but we know that for state governments, for local mayors, that they continue to be engaged with the Chinese, and certainly on the NGO front, they're very active there. It's been um, a way that at the federal level, as we talked about, that we see the relationship as it becomes increasingly complicated, that we see climate becoming an area of tension. Instead of looking for cooperation, we see carbon trade wars starting with the conflicts that we see around solar panels or competition around uh, EVs. It's very challenging to find a way pa uh, forward, even as we see many other countries are pushing ahead on this. But if we're going to achieve the kind of goals that we hope to see on China or hope to see on climate, we can't do it without China. And if the two largest emitting countries in the world can't find ways to cooperate, we're going to have a very difficult time trying to stick to any of the UN goals. So where does that leave us? For many, it's how do these local governments, the local state governments, really find a way and a path forward? They're very much on the front lines. They're the ones who have to implement a lot of the policies, and we see that there's a lot of engagement at that level. What can we learn from this type of cooperation, and where are the major roadblocks that we see ahead? We're fortunate that we've got a very distinguished panel who are here to discuss it today. I'm delighted to be able to introduce um, our speakers in the conversation. Before I introduce our panel that's going on here, we'll hear virtually from the former mayor of Seattle, Greg Nichols, who was the mayor of Seattle from 2002 to 2010 and was the former president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And Greg will be interviewed by Lena Garcia, also here with us virtually, who serves as the Director of International Affairs for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Thank you. Lena, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, I had the great pleasure of working with Mayor Greg Nichols when he was president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, let's just say about a dozen years ago. Um, but he left quite a... Um, impactful, um, uh, I guess, uh, creation at the U.S. Conference of Mayors when he founded and spearheaded the U.S. Conference of Mayors climate protection efforts um, and the Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Agreement, of which uh, still exists. Um, it's my understanding that we have over a thousand signatories, 1,066 to date. It may not sound like a large number, but as you know, mayors come and go. So um, mayors must join this uh, agreement again, new mayors. So it's it's really a, a wonderful number. Um, and now um, I would like to ask Mayor Nichols to please share some details about the agreement and its impact domestically as well as internationally. Um, once again, this has uh, made quite an impression on mayors um, across the country during a time when um, being involved in federal government was not a thing. <laughs> uh, and now we know that uh, how important it is. So Mayor Nichols, please uh, share details about the agreement and um, the impact that you think it's had both domestically and internationally. 
Thank you, Lena, and thank you to uh, Meridi the Meridian International Center for uh, hosting this forum and focusing on what I think is an incredibly important piece of it, and that is uh, how do we take action at the local uh, level to further our goals of protecting the climate for our kids and our grandkids. Um, I bring you greetings from Seattle, Washington. I'm sorry I can't be with you uh, in person. Uh, but it's nice and early in the morning here. We're enjoying our first Starbucks coffee, uh, and we'll catch up uh, in a couple of hours. Uh, I got involved in this issue uh, when I was mayor uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the winter of 2004-2005 was a very dry, warm winter in the Pacific Northwest. The ski season in the Cascade Mountains was canceled, which was a tragedy for many thousands of uh, avid skiers. But for me as mayor, it proposed, uh, it, it posed a different challenge, and that is that for over a century, we have relied on snowpack in the Cascade Mountains to produce green electricity and to produce uh, literally uh, the purest water that you can imagine from the melting snow. And we were at risk. And so for me, global warming suddenly became a local issue. Uh, and we weren't sure if the century-old systems would be sustainable uh, for us uh, into the future. So I pledged on February 16, 2005, that Seattle would meet the goals of the Kyoto Protocol, which had, went into effect that day in 141 countries, but not the United States of America, because we had refused to sign, uh, as if the United States had signed on. But I also knew that it's very difficult to ask people to make sacrifice for purely symbolic reasons. And if it was only Seattle, it would be purely symbolic. So I reached out to other mayors around, uh, uh, first, the ones who were likely uh, to support it initially, uh, and then to the U.S. Conference of Mayors and mayors all over the country to join together to pledge to do this action at the local level while our federal government was refusing to acknowledge that global warming existed, uh, that it was caused by human activity, uh, and that it caused an ex existential threat to our future. Uh, so we did get, as Lena mentioned, over a thousand mayors uh, representing over 90 million Americans to sign on. And that, I think, led to the ability of our uh, members of Congress uh, to feel that it was safe for them to start talking about climate change and climate protection. Uh, so I think it had a very real impact. I was able to be the voice of America's mayors at COP, uh, the COP in uh, Montreal in 2005, uh, and then again in Copenhagen in 2009, COP 11 and COP 15. And um, uh, so the message we were trying to send, Lena, internationally was that there was intelligent life in America, and we would someday rejoin the effort to protect the climate uh, and help lead that effort. Of course, in 2015, the Paris Accords were adopted. They were embraced by 195 countries, uh, all of the members of the United Nations. Uh, and they were relying very much on local efforts as well. The United States did sign on to the Paris Accords, but within a year, with a new president, the United States walked away from that table. And again, it was at the local level that we needed to take action. And that's important for a lot of reasons. One, making it safe for national policymakers to engage in the issue. Two, if we in our own homes, in our own communities, in our own cities take action, then our expectation is that other institutions will take action as well. So that idea of shared sacrifice, that all of us are part of the solution, that it will start with just little things in our own homes, in our own churches, in our own neighborhoods, will lead to uh, the solving of this global uh, crisis uh, I think is an important piece. It gives it a very strong foundation that isn't reliant on a particular administration in Washington, D.C. I had the chance to work with mayors from around the world, 
uh, on two occasions I met with large groups of Chinese mayors at the College of uh, Forestry and the Environment at Yale University. And what I found was after we after we blamed each other for the problems, the political problems around uh, climate protection, we came to a very fundamental agreement. And that is, as mayors, we were responsible for making sure that the people in our city had a safe and prosperous future in front of them. And that climate change was a threat to that. And so we found that there was a very basic understanding that we were all in this together, regardless of the relationship between our national governments. And I think that's an important piece for us to remember as things are going to get easier and get harder uh, over time. Thank you, Mayor. I think you covered my next two questions <laughs> regarding, <laughs> I know this is great, um, um, how, um, just one, just asking how, uh, because oftentimes there's been um, bureaucratic and political challenges at the federal level, so how do cities remain involved? And I think you sort of answered that. <laughs> um, and sharing other ways at, at the city level that um, city leaders can implement environmental policies and climate agreements. Um, maybe you can jump a little into that before we talk a little bit more about um, some of the work you've done with um, Chinese environmental leaders, which you also mentioned. But um, what are some other ways that you think uh, city level leaders um, can implement environmental policies and a climate agenda and boost their climate agenda? So to me, it's always been important to lead by example. So when we uh, pledged to reduce our emissions by the amount called for in, in the Kyoto Treaty, um, we knew that people would be watching us. And particularly other mayors who signed on would expect us to take real action. And so we did that. And the U.S. Conference of Mayors established the Climate Protection Center to uh, help us share best practices. So if something worked, great. If something didn't work, that's fine too. That's a good lesson learned that doesn't need to be repeated city after city after city. And so the sharing of information uh, within the United States between cities uh, and communities, and then the sharing of those best practices across uh, the world uh, are really important pieces. So we can start at the local level we can try things, we can prove that they work or not, uh, and then we can share that, and we in turn will get uh, that similar kind of information from uh, other places that have tried different things. You spoke a little bit about the, the work that you did through Yale, um, engaging Chinese mayors. Um, what prospects do you see for collaboration between U.S. and Chinese cities right now? What are some of the areas that you believe are most achievable? So I, I, I think that we are challenged, even though the United States is fully engaged in, in the Paris uh, Accord, uh, which we weren't for four years there, um, that could change in the future. Uh, and so having those uh, lines of communication between cities, having organizations such as the U.S. Conference of Mayors or the C40, uh, to help us make those connections uh, and uh, keep that conversation going regardless of what the national uh, political uh, temperature is, uh, I think is, is uh, incredibly important. Um, and as I said, it, very quickly in meeting with Chinese mayors, once we got through the mess of whatever the relationship was at the national level, we found very, very quickly common ground. We have the same existential threat by climate change, uh, and uh, we need to be uh, working actively together to find those solutions. And to me, those solutions have to start at the local level. Um, the national government needs to set policy and a framework, but it's going to be at the local level that each of us is going to change our behavior uh, and uh, our lifestyle in a way uh, that helps us to meet the goal of reducing and eliminating carbon emissions. So it sounds like um, you believe that the way to um, advance cooperation between U.S., China, um, 
on environmental issues is through bilateral city to city partnerships, as well as through coalitions like uh, work through the US Conference of Mayors or the C40. Um, one other question uh, to take that a step further, what role, if any, does the private sector play? What do you think um, cities can do along with or in partnership with the private sector? Well, the, the vast majority of our economy exists within the private sector. The vast majority of our uh, carbon emissions uh, occurs within that, that economic framework. So engaging the private sector is absolutely essential. And in some cases, what we found is the private sector actually leads. Uh, they understand, uh, for instance, Starbucks, local Seattle company, you may not have heard of it, but uh, they, uh, they recognize that they want to be in business in 50 years. They're going to need to know where they can grow coffee. And if they can't grow coffee where they are today, that's a problem. So they were very engaged with us, as were companies like uh, REI, Recreational Equipment uh, uh, Incorporated, the uh, co-op, um, uh, the cement plant uh, locally, Lafarge, uh, got involved because they are very intense creators of carbon emissions, and they understand they're going to have to change practices in order to survive uh, in the future economy. So uh, the private sector, the market, is what's going to help us uh, make the changes that are necessary. I also think it's important to recognize that this is an issue that should be uniting us. It shouldn't divide us. It should unite us across ages. Uh, my generation has a responsibility, I think, morally and ethically to uh, help uh, lead the way. And then the next generation is going to have to take it and get us across the finish line. Uh, we should be united behind this effort. Thank you, Mayor. I, I think we only have a little less than a minute left. Wanted to ask you if you had any final thoughts, any advice you could give uh, local leaders on how to engage um, or how to share exchange best practices, not only with um, Chinese environmental leaders, but any other leaders around the globe or well, even in the U.S. Whatever your um your situation is use the institutions that are available to you to get this conversation uh flowing uh meridian is doing a great uh, thing by uh, focusing on this today uh, but it needs to move forward whether it's your church your community your city uh your professional uh, uh associations you've got a responsibility and an opportunity to further this conversation, to make sure that we make a, a safe and prosperous future for our kids and our grandkids. Thank you, Mayor. Well, you're certainly viewed as a, a leader, um, a pioneer <laughs> um, among mayors, uh, starting the U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement and continuing to advocate for environmental issues now um, outside of elected office. So. Thank you for all your work. Thank you for your leadership. I know that um, I am sure that other mayors, not only in Seattle, but across the country, maybe even the world, turn to you for advice. So um, I, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add. I think. Uh, no, nope, just uh, everybody work hard today. Let's come up with some answers. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. It was a pleasure seeing you. to Mr. Peru Trivedi. I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. No, Lena, you nailed it. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mayor Nichols, for that excellent uh, presentation uh, and to you, Lena, for moderating that. My name is Peru Trivedi. I am the uh, Vice President for External and Corporate Affairs here at the Meridian International Center. It gives me great pleasure to share the stage with Dr. Turner and Mr. Zhu. Uh, Dr. Turner is the director of the China Environment Forum at the Wilson, Ce Wilson Center and has ample experience working on environmental challenges facing China, as well as looking at local government innovation in addressing those challenges. Mr. Zhu is director of conservation at the Paulson Institute. Uh, he also has experience leading the Paulson Institute's work 
to develop and implement initiatives that support China's efforts to better manage its environmental performance uh, in its overseas investments. Um, we're so pleased to have both of you today. Thank you. Happy Thank to be you. here. Um, all right, so the big question, big picture. The big question, okay. Uh, given the challenging relations uh, between the U.S. and China, um, the big question is, are local governments able to work with one another to find solutions to these pressing existential issues? Um, Dr. Turner, you've worked extensively on climate-related challenges and governance issues facing China. Um, have any of the U.S.-China city or state partnerships flourished uh, you know, despite COVID and the increasingly challenging uh, relations? Well, the, the, well, maybe turn me down a little bit. I feel really loud. Yeah, loud. Um, yeah I, I think that I mean, the U.S.-China relationship, it's been up and down for a while, right? Right, we're like siblings that argue. Um, and, and something that I've seen really constant is that, and that's, that's helped kind of keep the environmental and climate cooperation going has actually been a lot of US NGOs and foundations um, being, being the kind of glue. Um, like, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, in the Natural Resources Defense Council has an office in China. And they've stayed open during COVID in China. And, and they've continued their work. They've, they've done for years doing things on buildings and cities, decarbonization. They've got programs now looking, you know, working with provinces. And so they've been kind of a matchmaker, oftentimes, you know, bringing together cities between the U.S. and China. And obviously, we physically couldn't get there and from D.C. We can't fly straight to China anymore either. But one project I, I want to note, because Mayor Nichols talked about the role of industry. Um, Natural Resources Defense Council, it, it still kind of has a life of its own now. They had a project called Clean by Design, and it was focused in Guangdong and, and Jiang, Jiangsu province, which is, okay, your clothes that you're wearing, like something like 52% of all fabrics in the world have been produced in China. It used to be a huge source of pollution in, in, in the waterways, particularly in Guangdong and Jiangsu, and also very energy inefficient at these smaller mom and pop plants. Well, what they did was they brought the, the big the Walmarts, the Targets, and you know, all these clothes, H&M, these companies to meet with their, the kind of the, the supply chain in China and help and local officials to devise low cost, no cost ways of reducing water pollution and becoming more energy efficient. And the key here, and, that, and there's a lot of other NGOs that have done this, building the capacity of local governments and industry to do things that save them money. It works. Um, but, uh, and just, do I have a second more? Does Please. It, the, the most steady kind of local subnational cooperation with China has to be the country of California. Um, <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, back in the day, he was the first one that signed an MOU with China. And um, later on, you know, Governor, former Governor Jerry Brown, I mean, he's, he's a big advocate about working with China. I mean, some of it was because, you know, the air pollution hits them first that comes over from China. Um, where to start? Um, the California Air Resources Board. They've been instrumental. They were instrumental in helping China to create zero emissions policies for, for vehicles. And maybe why China is now leading the world on the electric vehicle industry. Because teaching them the regulations. And there have been a lot of you know, US NGOs that have worked. You know, CARB kind of laid the groundwork. But you know, WRI works on sustainable transport in China. And so, but, but California also, um, during the during the Trump administration, um, they created, um, Jerry Brown signed an agreement, I love it, an MOU with um, the, the climate envoy from China to create a California-China Climate Institute. And so they really have kind of, they're the West Coast keeping the flame alive, I'm the East Coast keeping the flame alive maybe in terms of the conversations between US and China. But what I love it there is that they, ha they have a specific program on subnational cooperation. So doing a lot of the nuts and bolts energy research and modeling, working with Chinese partners. I know it's not very sexy, guys, but you know we need this kind of modeling for energy efficiency, building energy efficiency. I can give you more examples, but it's California has really been the heart. And um, I'm actually starting to um, in work with the California China Climate Initiative. On, I, have a, I have a new project called U.S. China Cultivating U.S. China Climate Leadership on Food and Agriculture, and. California being our leading agricultural state. So I'll be doing more work with them as well. So I will zip it for now because you have more questions to ask That's us. 
That's fascinating on, on California. I know they're a model for the, the energy transition as well with the hydrogen facilities they're building. It's just uh, incredible. And they're changing the rest of the country too, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mr. Zhu, so increasingly international trade is occurring uh, at the state level rather than previously, which was just a federal conversation. Um, similarly, discussions on climate, environment, and collaboration are also happening at the state and local level. So um, the question to you, sir, is how can subnational diplomacy better support this collaboration in the future? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? Sure. Uh, uh, first of all, it's a great honor uh, for me to be here today and participate in this exciting discussion. Um, so I think uh, this goes back to what uh, Mayor uh, Nichols just said, um, because uh, when we talk about the subnational collaboration, we have to look at the interests uh, on both sides. And uh, today, when we talk about climate change and also the nature crisis, uh, those are global and planetary challenges, but their impacts are most acutely felt at the local levels. So for subnational level leaders and mayors, uh, they are often at the forefront of addressing those challenges. And certainly those mayors and subnational leaders will benefit a lot by learning from each other. And also based on our interactions with our partners in China, I think there is this genuine and a very strong interest in learning from um, US and many other developed countries on how to promote sustainability in China. I think the interest is there. And for the Paulson Institute, uh, we describe ourselves as a think and do tank. I think we can play a role in terms of helping identify and match uh, the interests and the needs on both sides. And this goes back to what uh, Jennifer just said. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is what we have been doing over the last decade or so. So we initiated the China's mayor uh, training program uh, from 2012 in partnership with the Chinese Mayor Association uh, and many other partners. So each year we select a small group of uh, mayors and subnational uh, leaders, we develop a very customized uh, curriculum and we take them to some US cities that face uh, or share very similar challenges. So, so, for, so far we have taken Chinese delegations of the mayors and subnational leaders to a host of uh, US cities including Philadelphia, New York, uh, Miami, and then um, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and even New Orleans because those ch cities all share some very similar challenges faced by Chinese cities and mayors. Um, I think uh, another point I have to make is that you know, international exchanges, uh, bilateral exchanges, are supposed to be a two-way street. So at this point, I think there's a lot of interest on the China side to learn from the US in terms of best practices. But at the same time, I think some mayors and some national leaders might find it quite, uh, might find their uh, Chinese counterpart quite innovative and effective in addressing some of the common challenges. So I believe uh, in those new areas, uh, um, these uh, unmet demand and uh, interest could open up new opportunities for future exchanges uh, that are solution-oriented and pragmatic. Yeah. Thank you. No, that's, that's brilliant. I'm glad you mentioned exchanges. That's what Meridian focuses on uh, as our sort of bread and butter um, thing. My colleague Frank Justice and I uh, always look forward to the DNI, the annual DNI report on geopolitics and trends and big picture stuff. That, sorry, acronym, D Director of National Intelligence uh, Report. And one of the interesting things from this year's report was, uh, and I quote, Beijing's belief that local officials in the U.S. are more pliable than their federal counterparts. Um, now, this is a question to, to you both. To what extent are these concerns valid within the sustainability space? And can the monumental issue of combating climate change and the U.S.-China working on it at the subnational level be isolated from these national security risks? It's a lot to unpack. I, first of all, he's yeah. very nerdy because he looks forward to this report. <laughs> um, so, but when they, when they said pliable, They're kind of referring to the fact that, that well, just think of like, what about the, like the North? Ability to influence, I guess, is in this context of pliable? Well, I mean, Receptiveness, well, too. Well, I mean, think that, 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 I mean, what comes to mind is that, you know, there's been a lot of 
concern about Chinese companies coming and buying land. Mm -hmm. And like 18 states have said, we will not sell land. There was that North Dakota corn processing plant that was going to be bringing jobs, and it got halted. Um, is that what saying? Is that what they're referring to about, about economic investment? I in believe local so. Officials? Okay. Yeah, that's probably one of the bigger dimensions too. I mean, I think that like where where, where we work, it's less. You know, because I mean, in some ways, for many, for, for years now, the environment has been a kind of safe space for conversations between the two countries. And, and even as we've already hinted at, even at the, when the national level, when things aren't great. Um, I think, what, what do we want to add here? That, that, I mean, like for your project, I mean, we've had the challenge too, not us, but a lot of US states and cities who want to work with China, like during COVID, we physically couldn't go there. But then, you know, Zoom conversations, but what about what? What do you think about this? Is uh, well, please. I think it's a very uh, challenging question. So I think this goes back to uh, what I just said or, or a couple of minutes ago, because uh, I think on the China side there is this very strong interest in learning from uh, U.S. Uh, counterparts, uh, and also in terms of these changes, I understand that there are security concerns, uh, like Jennifer said, because in the uh, space of environment, the climate change, nature conservation, I think. It, uh, this is still a, a relatively safe space. And also even in the area of renewable energy and other fairly sensitive uh, technology related areas, I think uh, you know, technologies, specific products can be pri uh, proprietary, but uh, new ideas, new concepts, new models, new mechanisms, new systems, those are not necessarily proprietary. So exchanges in those areas can promote benefits on both sides. So that's my answer to your question. Excellent. But, yeah. but I also want, you know, should point out too, and um, so, so I would like to know your thoughts, that, but even within China, there's also been kind of a chilling effect mm -hmm. for our yeah. Chinese counterparts. Like, yeah, are true. they returning your calls, <laughs> right? I mean, people you know will respond, but, um, and, and that's something that we also have to get order. So it's, just that it's not just like both sides, but again, looking for areas where there's not direct competition. And, and I think that with the, with, with the climate area, I mean, I know that, I mean, yeah. Hank Paulson's going back to China too, right? <laughs> right? And, that, yeah, yeah. and we're starting to see, and I think the California folks are also going to be interacting with their Chinese partners more in person. But yeah, but it, it, it's a little, this little suspicion stuff is on both sides. But again, I feel like on the environment area, there's still hope. Yeah, it's good. That's good to hear. I'm a glass half full. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Zhu, um, you lead the sustainable investment and trade component of the Paulson Institute. Um, how does nature conservation fit into the climate discussion? Absolutely. Um, well, my favorite topics. Um, so today when we talk about uh, climate change and nature conservation, we pretty much treat them as separate issues or separate challenges. But in fact, these two are very much intertwined. They are essentially the two sides of the same coin because uh, nature conservation in the form of uh, nature-based solutions in the climate change area um, can greatly enhance our climate efforts. Uh, for example, according to the Nature Conservancy and the research partners, uh, uh, nature-based solutions can provide up to 37% of emission reductions uh, uh, needed before 2030 in order to keep the global temperature rise below two degrees centigrade. Uh, in addition, natural infrastructure, for example, uh, you know, such as uh, restoration of mangroves, seagrass beds, and uh, coral reefs, when combined with conventional green infrastructure, can work most effectively to shield some coastal communities from some of the most devastating natural disasters uh, caused by climate change. Um, but uh, climate change and nature conservation do not always exist in harmony, of course. Uh, in some examples, um, Renewable energy development projects can take, take up as much as uh, 10 times the land as uh, traditional uh, energy projects. In some offshore wind farms, uh, the wind turbines can pose serious threats to migratory birds. So how we design and implement renewable energy projects and other climate efforts will have immense implications for nature conservation. So uh, it's imperative for us to maximize alignment between climate change efforts, and nature conservation. Also, a next point I have to make is in our current discussions about climate change, one of the underappreciated fact uh, is that we think climate change affects humans and our economic prosperity only, but in fact, it affects our natural world and ecosystem as well. 
because you know, our survival and economic prosperity ultimately depend on a thriving and healthy natural environment. So uh, in this sense, enhancing the climate resilience of our ecosystems should be a broader approach to addressing climate change. So in those new areas, I believe there could be potentially more opportunities and, and potential for subnational level exchanges and uh, knowledge sharing. Yeah. Great. Um, if you haven't already, uh, I encourage you to check out Dr. Turner's extensive work on U.S. and China, leading uh, the Wilson Center's China Environment Forum, and also exchanges for over 23 years. Um, so like the Paulson Institute, I'm curious, have you worked with cities and provinces on these issues and kind of just your yeah, well, I've, top line thoughts on all of that work? I've, I'm very much, my job is very much a matchmaker. I give give two two quick examples. One there's one project that was called Choke Point China, looking at the water energy food nexus. So looking at energy's water footprint, but then also water's energy footprint. And did you know, here in DC as well, 30% of our electricity goes to wastewater treatment, mainly to treat sludge. Isn't that you weren't expecting that topic, no. were you? No. So sludge, and, and 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 it's a huge problem in both the US and China. And you know, I did, we'd actually did some reporting on it, had infographics, and the EPA came knocking at my door one day because they said, hey, we want to work with Chinese cities on methane capture at wastewater treatment plants. So it was my dream. So I got to lead more research, but also do study tours. And I would bring them not just to DC, but to California. Los Angeles County has got the most amazing wastewater treatment plant that puts food waste with the sludge, cooks it up. I call it poop soup. <laughs> and it releases methane that's captured, and it powers the plant, and they sell it to com compress natural gas. China has been working on this. They've had some bumps. They need more, they needed more kind of best practices. So, so again, so I was a sludge matchmaker. Who knew that could be a thing? Um, I also had a project uh, earlier on about green ports. Um, I mean, Port of Shanghai, I think back in 2014, the pollution was so thick that they had to guide ships in by satellite, right? So, so. And then we started, and, and a little bit before that, but the port of Shanghai and LA started becoming green, the, a green port initiative mm -hmm. that predated Obama, but then it kind of got swooped up into his climate work, right? And so I got to bring some Chinese you know, port and Ministry of Transport people to the US and, and have conversations. And at the port of LA, and they, they knew their Shanghai partners, and they said, the Chinese are just moving so fast in terms of like, getting rid of diesel in terms of loading the ships. And, but they, they, they needed some kind of in, good insights from the US about how a lot of our ports are working with communities, right? And so it was, it was one of those beautiful areas where we rely on our two ports trading with each other, but it wasn't a direct competition, so no worries about on the national security front. Mm -hmm. And so, so again, I just facilitated conversations. And, and I also, a lot of the US NGOs that do work at the subnational level, I feature them, but yeah. I will stop there because, I mean, I should have ended with sludge. That was just too good. <laughs> Ending with sludge is good. Um, are there any questions from the audience? In the back, please. Hi, my name is uh, Brad Wedzi. I'm an undergraduate at the University of Georgia. So uh, I guess my question is, uh, one of the things I took notice was the CHIPS Act uh, out of the Biden administration and talking about semiconductors. And I'm curious about uh, competition between China and the US and I guess the limits of subnational co cooperation. I mean, if we're restructuring economies going um, in the direction of like conflict and of war, you know, how, how does that impede subnational process, like processes to you know, combat climate change and all these initiatives that we start. Because one of the notable features of the uh, CHIPS Act is just how it kind of bars China and US cooperation. Um, and and it, it keeps a lot of information prioritary to the US. And so I was just curious about, you know, when we have these um, efforts in the name of conflict and competition, how does this sort of impact your work um, in the future? Thank you. Do you want to start? I defer to yeah. <laughs> Great question. Well, I think that, but so what you said, and like I said at the very beginning, there's been conflict between the two countries. Let me give you one quick example. One of my, my very, one of my first meetings that I put on here at the Woodrow Wilson Center was the he, then the head of NOAA. And he told a story, he's the you know, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And he told a story that 
that, that he was, this is in 1999, 19, uh, yeah, 1999, that he was um, supposed to go to China to for spend two weeks there doing, you know, getting all the climate people together and, you know, this, and it, it was very exciting. Two days before he left, the, the U.S. accidentally bombed the Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia. And so he contacted his colleagues and said at the embassy, the U.S. embassy, you know, the Chinese embassy in D.C. said, I said, you guys probably don't want me to come. And they're like, why do you say that? So, so he went to China and did his two weeks of work. And so, it was, so in some ways, sometimes the climate science, we sometimes call it science diplomacy or environmental diplomacy. I mean, I've had, I can't remember, someone, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? Our relationship is complex. And there's, there's a lot of dedicated people in the, in the think and do space, the NGOs, the foundations that see that, that in terms of climate and a lot of global environmental solutions, if the US and China are at least not walking in parallel, then it's, in, there's a Chinese phrase, wan dan la, it's all over. Um, but in that walking, you know, parallel, there's also kind of a race to the top, like electric vehicles, right? You know, we can, you know, China lit the match to, to turn the world moving faster towards electric vehicles, but racing to the top, not only between the two countries, but in our investments and helping other countries, other countries in the global south also go cleaner and greener. The world is big enough for both the US and China to do this kind of energy investment. But you're right, it is a big hurdle at the national level and I know I'm smiling, but it, it is a sensitive time. But at the same time, I mean, you're, you and I, we're both still seeing the climate and environment folks engaging, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, I'd like to go back to what uh, Mayor Nichols said. I think uh, he said, you know, climate change uh, in combination with uh, biodiversity loss or nature loss are ex existential challenges facing humanity. Um, and, uh, you know, those issues require global efforts and those issues should unite us and instead of dividing us. So I you know I completely agree with what uh, Mayor uh, Nico said, and I think uh, you know, based on our experience in China, I think there is still space for this kind of collaboration in the space of environment and climate change. And you might be, we might be seeing more in the in the years to come that that maybe there'll be more like U.S. Europe. Maybe we kind of have to be partnering. Maybe the mayors and the cities come together in groups, then it's a little less sensitive. Kind of like, you know, you had a couple, you broke up, and you're still at the same party, but you can work together. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, at this, we I question. can't say no to Ms. Hong Sha Lu. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this is um, a delight to hear California. It's at the forefront of US-China climate collaboration in initiative. So. I would like to hear our experts' view about how EU fit in the larger picture. So like Boeing, Airbus, you know, China turns to either of them at times of ups and down in this relationship. Climate change related collaboration, I wonder, you know, how China would choose partners between EU and the US. So that's something I would like to learn from our panelists. How do you compare EU versus US with China? Do you have uh, no, um, because you know, um, because uh, for the policy because we are a US and China focused organization, we don't really interact a lot of with um, uh, European partners. Um, but in terms of, uh, no, uh, I'm going to speak from my experience. So for um, climate change related really issues, I think the, our current focus is, on very, is very much focused on the intersection between climate change and nature conservation. So that's why I have emphasized, uh, you know, there, this is a particular area where we could see some potential productive partnership and uh, collaboration between US and, and China. But uh, I really cannot speak to you know, the, U, the EU part of uh, this uh, interaction. Well, yeah. I mean, what's notable, you know, the, the EU and China have also had, the feathers are been getting a little ruffled too, right? Um, but, but, I, and, but I think what I've noticed, you know, we hear this at the national level, the US and the EU, you know, even on the climate fronts are coming together a bit more. So I, I but, but I think though that, you know, just reflecting back on what Mayor Nichols said that, that cause I know that, that European city mayors also work with their Chinese counterparts. Um, I, I don't, 
it's, it's, good. it's, it's hard for me to, 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 predict, to predict which way it goes, but I do know that you know, there is, there still seems, you know, and, I, and we'll know, more. talk to us in a year, right? As things really start opening up, but, but I get the sense that, you know, that we are going to see more, you know, the, the Western countries getting re-engaged more in person with China, but fingers crossed. I think what's interesting, uh, just as an anecdote, is to see China being uh, on the world stage as a, as a diplomatic actor and brokering peace in the Middle East and in you know being a part uh, of the negotiations in Europe and uh, and uh, it's all very interesting uh, interesting trends in diplomacy between the two countries. So with that, I will um, invite all of you to join us for lunch in Meridian House's dining room. Uh, please join me in thanking, first of all, Deborah Blair. Uh,